Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. You will have noticed in the dispatches coming out of Ukraine that more and more media outlets now refer to the country's capital as Kiev, not Kiev. They're opting for the Ukrainian pronunciation over the Russian one. It is a slight but significant change in terminology, an indication of which way the winds are blowing in this information war regardless of the advances that Russian forces have been making on the ground. In their president, Volodymyr Zelensky, Ukrainians have an effective messenger. He's a former comedian turned political actor who has been rallying support both at home and abroad. Russian media outlets, meanwhile, are not even calling this a war. They have to stick to the official line that it's a special military operation. Failure to do so has its consequences. Between the misinformation coming out of Moscow the NATO expansion angle that gets underplayed in the Western news media, and the larger battle for hearts and minds, we have a lot to get to. Our starting point this week is Kiev. In a 21st century information war, waged on multiple digital fronts, the Russian attack on the TV tower in Kiev felt like a throwback to an earlier, simpler time. When television was king, and taking over the airwaves meant that an invading force or rebel army could control the narrative. TV no longer matters the way it once did, but it clearly matters to Vladimir Putin. The attacking of the Kiev uh, TV tower was, was, of course, a deliberate strategy. This is where the uh, actual war and uh, media war are converging because Putin did his best to have Russian society brainwashed by propaganda. So he assumes that everyone else is like that too, which is uh, wrong on many different levels, because it's really not like Ukrainians are only fighting back the because their t television tells them to. Captain Army Alexander Lysenko tragically погиб при исполнении воинского долга. Он участвовал в специальной операции на Украине. To hear the Russian media describe it, there is no war in Ukraine just a special military operation ordered by the Kremlin. When the independent outlet TV Dodged called it an invasion instead, and the radio station Echo Moskvi did the same, the prosecutor general's office ordered them to be taken off the air. There are tit-for-tat measures taken over the information side of this war by political players and big tech companies. The European Union has banned Russian state-owned channels RT and Sputnik, leaving it to its member states and their regulators to enforce the new policy. YouTube, TikTok and Meta, which controls Facebook and Instagram, have all blocked RT and Sputnik news content. Google has removed the channels from its news search tool and dropped their mobile apps from its Play Store. Russia's media regulator subsequently throttled Twitter, slowing its loading speed down to a crawl for what it called Twitter's failure to take down fake news posts on Ukraine. Taking Russian media off the air on, on the West is a bit of an overreaction. Who is this supposed to protect? I don't think anybody in the West is really taking RT or, or these other Russian state media affiliates very seriously to the extent that they spread propaganda and giving Russia and Russian state media the option of seeming like they are the victims of, of some over aggressive Western restrictions on speech and on media muddies the water on who is suppressing speech. Media control is, is very essential for Putin right now. Uh, not just Russia, any country that is in the middle of a war effort particularly one as contentious as the one uh, that he's launched now. But there are better ways to deal with Russian misinformation and disinformation than just outright censorship. I'm worried about the precedent that sets, for one. And if the West is condemning the Russian government for uh, cracking down on speech and free media over in Russia, it's not a great look for the West to be engaging in activities that appear uh, to be the same. For every Russia Today that is cancelled in Europe, for every YouTube or Russian blog that is cancelled, we will see uh, repercussions for the Russian audience that is going to be much more severe. It, to show it is most likely that BBC and other major 
foreign networks uh, would be cancelled in Russia. There's a likelihood that YouTube would be shut down in Russia as well. We are already looking at the limiting of capacity of Facebook. News outlets like to tell stories of heroes. And in Volodymyr Zelensky, the Western media have their audiences believing they have found one. The Ukrainian president has provided them with plenty of telegenic material, inspiring Ukrainians through his defiant messages aimed at the Kremlin, videos that have gone viral. Zelensky's unusual path to power, he's a comedian who once played the president on Ukrainian television, usually gets a mention. What goes underreported is that Zelensky's politics can be problematic. There's also the small matter of the Azov Brigade, an openly fascist military unit that Zelensky's government tolerates within its army's ranks as long as those neo-Nazi soldiers are fighting Russians. In any wartime scenario, there's always a push to simplify narratives. Ha dimostrato sangue freddo, coraggio, determinazione. To flatten nuance and to turn everything into a kind of black and white narrative. Zelensky does not have fantastic democratic credentials. The Ukrainian security service has investigated one of his chief rivals, the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Kalichka. Zelensky has had a different political rival put under house arrest. He's closed down uh, pro-Russian independent media outlets. But it complicates the, the picture to cast this as purely a, a democracy defending itself against uh, an authoritarian country, which is somewhat true. It's a lot more complicated than that in reality. None of Zelensky's closest aides have any far-right links at all. Sure, there is a certain element. And yeah, uh, clips have emerged on social media where these far-right battalions are providing military training to civilians and... Of course, they've been played on repeat on Russian state media because that's their tangible proof of uh, far right presence in Ukraine. But they're not in power or they don't have any political presentation on the national level. Another angle, a vital contextual one, underplayed in American and Western news coverage of the Ukraine story is the expansion of NATO premeditated, unjustified. The U.S. State Department briefings, fronted by Ned Price, often include intelligence assessments from agencies like the CIA. The CIA's director is William Burns. He's done two stints at the embassy in Moscow, speaks fluent Russian, and happens to be completely out of step with the Biden administration on how this crisis came to be. In 2019, Burns wrote a memoir in which he called NATO's expansion into ex-Warsaw Pact countries needlessly provocative, warned that Ukraine was the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, and not just hardliners, he said, that even Putin's sharpest liberal critics saw NATO expansion as a direct challenge to Russian interests. You won't see William Burns getting any face time on the American airwaves these days. That would just complicate matters in a media space where the blame is Vladimir Putin's and his alone. The reason we're not hearing about William Burns' warning uh, now in the media is because it, it really undermines a lot of the talking points from Western governments that create this flattened picture of, of, of the reality of what we're seeing and that Western actions have nothing to do with it. Because if Burns and others who are warning about this were correct, then that means that there should have been a different set of policies that were pursued following the Cold War. If you acknowledge that U.S. or Western actions have contributed to Russia feeling under an existential threat, people are just saying that this is tantamount to saying that Russia is justified and that you're buying into Russian propaganda. In fact, no, it's simply modern history. This context is very important and we can't have a full picture of what's going on over there if we don't have it. NATO was always part, part of the story, but it was never that part of the story that could explain or justify what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Ukraine was not on the verge of uh, entering NATO. NATO was not providing Ukraine with something that could have endangered Russia in the, any foreseeable future.
and what is happening to Ukraine is not because of NATO, it is because of Ukraine not being what Russia wants it to be or specifically what Vladimir Putin wants it to be. If truth really is the first casualty of war, then nuance in reporting would come a close second. That is the kind of journalism that is coming out of Ukraine. The victims of this war, the news-consuming public, and the story they cannot get enough of all deserve better. Ukrainian journalists have told us that one of the more frustrating aspects of this story has been the shortage of Ukrainian voices in the negotiations between Moscow and the West. Since the invasion, though, some of that has changed. Minakshi Ravi is here with more. Richard, anyone watching Ukraine's media and digital pushback over the past 10 days will have witnessed a huge surge of activity, some of it understandably quite chaotic, but not without impact. First is the Ukrainian response to Russia's digital warfare. Prior to the invasion, Russian state-backed attacks on Ukrainian government websites were well underway, with hacks and malware spreading into computer networks. Ukraine's Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, then announced the creation of a volunteer cyber army. More than 200,000 people have signed up to a group on Telegram Messenger, where they're issued various tasks. That cyber army has taken credit for takedowns and defacements of Russian government and media sites. Ukrainian media outlets have also ramped up operations by banding together. The country's four largest media groups have formed a body they call United News. They released a statement saying they would join forces to provide an uninterrupted flow of information from across the country. One reason they had to come together was to pool resources that are in short supply. Some outlets have asked for financial support from news consumers around the world. A GoFundMe page was set up by an executive at the English language Kiev Independent, which has collected half a million dollars in funding in less than a week. The money is being split between numerous outlets and is being used specifically to help relocate key news operations outside the war zone, safer spaces for Ukrainian journalists as Russia's attacks intensify. Thanks, Mina. Back to the international side of the Ukraine story now and an aspect of the news coverage that has left many viewers shaking their heads. Some reporters and television hosts, white ones, pointing out how relatable Ukrainian refugees are with their blonde hair, their blue eyes. Using words like civilized to distinguish Ukrainians from the kind of refugees that journalists have covered from Syria, for example, or Afghanistan. These are incidents, terms that have somehow slipped out during the live coverage of news when stuff tends to happen. However, the framing and the terminology expose a thing or two about double standards in reporting depending on a refugee's skin color or their religious beliefs. H.A. Hellier has spent a career in academia studying Europe's treatment of ethnic minorities. He joins us now. Mr. Hellier, let's start with this. There's not a great deal of subtlety, is there, in some of the bias that we've seen in the journalism on Ukraine, particularly the refugee angle. What has the coverage of this story told you about the hierarchy of human worth insofar as some elements of the media are concerned? So I'm glad you said some elements in the media, because I think a lot of people have actually done the job really well over the past week. Um, but we're focusing quite rightly on not just a few rotten apples, but quite a large uh, phenomenon that exists in, in much of the Western media when it comes to uh, coverage over the last week. These are um, Christians, they're white, they're... Um, they're very similar to people, many people who live in Poland. And, they're all and there is a hierarchy. Um, and the hierarchy has to do with race. The hierarchy has to do with religious affiliation. We're talking about war in the Ukraine and the barbarism that is unfolding as though it was somehow uh, unique. It's not unique. Now the unthinkable has happened to them. And this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. We've seen much worse than this many times uh, just over the past decade. And the, the shock and horror that you see from some elements in the Western media, as though uh, this was something unique and special. Of course, it is special because everybody's suffering is special, but it's not unique. And when we make that argument that it is unique, that we haven't seen this before, 
It means that we're erasing and making invisible all those people that have suffered so tremendously in other places, very often, by the way, at the hands of the same military hardware that Vladimir Putin is putting to work in Ukraine. We're not talking about a single journalist here, are we? Or even a couple. This has happened across a variety of news outlets, including this one, Al Jazeera. What does that tell us about how widely ingrained this kind of thinking really is? So we have two major issues here. One, there are going to be people who are frankly, bluntly, very openly racist and bigoted. But that's not the bigger problem. The structural way in which certain things can be said that are incredibly bigoted and racist in and of themselves, even though the people themselves who are uttering them might be you know, very nice and very professional and so on. That's the problem that I see right here. These are prosperous. I'm loath to use the expression. These are prosperous middle class people. These are not obviously refugees trying to get away from areas in the Middle East. I'm not saying that all of these people are racist. I'm saying that there is a wider issue here where we are not sufficiently aware of the biases that we hold. And that allows for a lot of this stuff to become far more mainstream than we're really comfortable talking about. Given what we've heard from the media and from some European politicians on refugees, is it any wonder that Ukrainians are being welcomed at these borders, allowed to cross them in ways that Afghans and Syrians were not? So, uh, unfortunately, I'm not surprised. Uh, and I say this as somebody who's been studying uh, racial politics and, uh, and ethnic minorities in Europe for 20 years. And, you know, people have been arguing, and I've seen this, you know, multiple times over the last few days, that, oh, well, it's natural um, that people will have more of an affinity uh, with those who look like them and so on. And, and I'm not sure that they really recognize entirely the, uh, the ramifications of what they're saying, because most of our societies, if not all of our societies, are not homogenous. There is diversity that exists within them right now let alone as a result of recent migrations of you know, refugees and so on. It's quite extraordinary that in 2022, we continue to have to have these conversations. Um, and I'm very glad and grateful that so many uh, of our governments have accepted the Ukrainian refugees that are fleeing Putin's invasion. Um, I hope that we learn a valuable lesson here, that it's not simply Ukrainians who deserve that right and privilege, uh, but it's any human being that we have the opportunity to help. What about some of the basic inconsistencies we're seeing in the way that certain developments are reported? We've all seen those videos of Ukrainians making Molotov cocktails, forms of resistance that are depicted in the media as being legitimate. The styrofoam works to make the Molotov cocktail sticky, to help it stick. And they're making it according to a recipe that has been distributed by the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. Really quite extraordinary. Unpack those videos for us, please, given the way that the Western media have often depicted resistance fighters in places like Syria and Palestine. So there are going to be different ways in how these things are going to be portrayed, right? These are the only weapons she has, but she says she's ready to fight. Mm -hmm. Let those Russian come here, she says. We are ready to greet them. When it comes to Ukraine, it's Russia intervening, i.e. not an ally of ours, into a country that we perceive as an ally of ours. There's this allied ship um, that I think is a big element in the discussion. Now, having said that, then there are other examples, um, and you saw that in Syria, where you wouldn't necessarily be portraying people who are fighting against Bashar al-Assad in quite the same way, because the perception would be, well, yes, we don't like Bashar al-Assad, but all of these brown people, they basically fight with each other all the time. And, you know, it's a Sunni versus Shi'i thing. And you know, it becomes this, uh, this very pseudo complex uh, situation in order to avoid saying, no, actually, this is wrong and we should try to help. Um, and you see it in the same way in how we describe now people who are volunteering to go and fight in Ukraine. And um, what's made you want to come here? They look like they need help. We're young, strong, fit men. We can help. So why not? The coverage incredibly different 
than even aid workers who wanted to go and help people in Syria uh, during the early years of the war. Let's dig a little deeper into Syria. What should the West have learned from that conflict, given Russia's involvement there, its use of misinformation in that space, and the suffering that the Syrian people experienced as a result of the conflict? So I want to take us back to when um, chemical weapons were used in Syria and the so-called red line that then U.S. President Barack Obama sort of laid out and how it, it wasn't held, okay? The line was not held. It wasn't that long after that that you saw uh, Russia not only up its game, but also invade and occupy and annex Crimea. And how we got here, partly at least, is one, we systematically dehumanized all of these populations by not considering them worthy of solidarity. But this isn't a place, with all due respect, um, you know, like Iraq or Afghanistan. This is a relatively civilized, uh, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully too, uh, city where you... And we see that very clearly in how we treat a population that we actually do want to engage in solidarity with. So you have all of these countries in the European Union, but also the UK that are now changing their visa requirements tremendously and opening up their borders in ways they never ever would have done for Afghans, for Syrians, for Iraqis and so on, right? So that's what's possible. It's just that it's not possible if you're not a Ukrainian or you're not perceived within this quote unquote white category. So that's one. Two, uh, I think it sends a massive message and did send a massive message to the likes of Putin that the West simply isn't going to uh, hold them accountable, nor is the international community more generally. So these two things, I think, really go hand in hand. We're not simply engaging in this systematic dehumanization of these populations. We're also uh, encouraging very aggressive powers to engage in really negative ways that impact on our security more generally uh, and also promote um, a, far, a far more disorderly uh, world today. We're going to leave it there. H.A. Hellier, thanks for speaking with us here at The Listening Post today. Thank you. My pleasure. And finally, a story as big as the war in Ukraine, the incessant updates, the news from across all those platforms can make it difficult to get a wider view, the bigger picture. So we thought we would share a few articles, Twitter accounts, and some news outlets that we found helpful this past week. They offer a more nuanced view. They ask some inconvenient questions, if that's what it takes. Katrina Vanden Heuvel is the editorial director at the American news magazine, The Nation. She shares threads and articles that are worth your while, like this one from the magazine that she oversees. Another Twitter account, much less prolific, is that of writer Anatole Lievin. His article on the website Responsible Statecraft was what led us to him. The site's Twitter account, that's Responsible Statecraft, is definitely worth a follow as well. Another outlet is Open Democracy. One article we would recommend is by Moscow-based professor Greg Uden. It's getting on. It was published back on February 24th, but remains relevant. Uden does not have a Twitter account of his own, but he is widely read inside and outside Russia. You can check out this interview that Medusa did with him on March 2nd about dissent and resistance within Russia. A few other Twitter accounts that bring some nuance, some bilingual content to the mix. Kimberly St. Julian Varnon, is a historian specializing in Russia and Eastern Europe. She writes for the H Ukraine website. And then there's Elena Chernyenko, special correspondent at the Russian newspaper Kommersant. Finally, for those who prefer to listen to their news rather than read it, The Russia Guy is a podcast run by Kevin Rothrock. My guest is Marlene Laurel. Dr. Laurel wrote a book last year titled, Is Russia Fascist? Unraveling Propaganda East and West. And it has remarkable applications to today's crisis in Ukraine. It focuses on journalism, academia, and activism in the country. Those are some of our recommendations for where to get your news on this story. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.